Okay, guys, here goes. We're having a crack at part two from exam two, 2021 methods. Um, five questions. That means that it's really calculator intensive, in my opinion. The reason being, you don't get many marks for each question. Um, worth more than one mark, you've got to show you're working. They're not drawn to scale and exact value must be given unless otherwise specified. Okay, negative cos 2x plus cos 4x. Negative cos 2x plus cos 4x. I've got to put an end bracket, make sure my calculator is in radians. Define. That's f of x. g of x is 2 cos x. 2 cos really couldn't be bothered doing this, but way too many people asked me to do it. I even got emails, so I figure I should. Um, state the period of this uh, and the amplitude. So the period is 2 pi on n, and in this case is 1, coefficient of x. The amplitude is 2. Find the value of c for which f of c equals 0 on the domain 0 to pi on 2. So um, f of, let's call it c, equals 0. Um, we want it between 0, it's less than c, that's annoying, I probably should have used x, um, which is less than pi on 2. to solve for C. It's usually easy to, better to leave it as um, <coughs> x. C is pi on 6. Find the minimum value of f. Um, where are we? f of x, we've got to find the minimum, negative 2, all one markers, so we just pump them in out. Parts of the graph of f and g are shown, the graphs of f and g touch but do not cross um, at the points p and q, pi on 3v. Well, because it's symmetric, P has to be negative pi on 3. We'll have to find out what V is. But what we can do is we can say let F of X equal G of X. And we can do it from negative pi. Actually, is less than... No, it must be pi on 2. Pi on 2 is less than X, which is less than pi on 2. Okay, we don't include the endpoint, so it's negative pi on 3. So I'm just going to write f of x equals g of x, given negative pi on 2 is less than x, which is less than pi on 2. Um, p is the x value, which is negative pi on 3. And... We just got to find f of negative pi on three, which is one. Find the value of the derivative of f and the value of the derivative of g at pi on three. So d dx of f of x at pi on 3, negative root 3, the same for g of x, so f dash of pi on 3 is negative root 3, g dash of pi on 3 is negative root 3, that tells us that that's a tangent at that point because they've got the same gradient.
find the equation of the tangents of the graph of f and g at pi on 3. So it's not going to matter which one we use. We just say tan line at the point pi on 3, negative root 3x. Make sure you have y equals plus root 3 pi on 3. I think it said plus 1. Mm -hmm. Find the equation perpendicular. So we want to do the same thing, but this time we want to do normal. At the point pi on 3, root 3 on 3. To make sense, a negative reciprocal minus root 3 pi on 9 plus 1. Now you could sketch these to make sure that they're correct, but I kind of can't be bothered. Find the area of the shaded region. So our area, negative pi on 2 to pi on 2 of g of x minus f of x dx. The higher graph minus the lower graph between the endpoints. Now you could have also used symmetry and gone from 0 to pi on 2 and just multiplied it by 2. Um, g of x minus, remember to do higher minus lower. The only difference it'll give you is a negative instead of a positive. So four square units. It's a lot of working room for nothing. Oh, that's finished. Okay. Okay, the function h of x, 3,200 on x minus five squared. Um, will be x minus five from 10 to 50. Models the rate of change at which heat is lost from the water in a hot water puddle with insulation, hot water pipe where h is the rate at which units of heat are lost from the bottle and x is the radius of the h is the rate at which x is the radius of the hot water pipe with its insulation in millimeters the radius of the pipe without its insulation is 10 millimeters Find the rate at which heat is lost um, with no insulation, correct to three decimal places. Okay, so now we've got to set this function up. I saw 3,200. I think it was x minus 5 squared. And then log e of x minus 5. But I didn't see the log e. Probably missed some stuff. On 4, that wasn't bad. So I want to define that, I'll call it f of x. Let's sketch it to make sure I haven't stuffed up putting in the function incorrectly. It was between, no, it was from 10 to 50. Now let's change our domain to be zero to 50 and zero, I think it was about 50 as well. Okay, so that looks the same. Okay, find the rate at which the heat is lost. So it's not the derivative, it's just this, because this is the rate function. And we want it at 10. 28.562. To three decimal places. State the derivative of h of x. Um, I wonder if I actually want you to put the domain as well. Wow, that's ugly. Still pretty ugly. Okay. We can make that negative 2 to the power of 4, negative 4 log e2. So h dash x is negative 3200. That's all I saw. <laughs> x minus 5 cubed 
and then 2 log e x minus 5 minus 4 log e 2 minus because it was on the bottom. I think it was plus 1 or minus 1. Minus 1. Okay, find the maximum rate at which the heat is lost from the water. Okay, so you could look that equals zero, but we could also say F max of this sucker between 10 and 50. Thirty-six point seven eight eight. So three decimal places. I'll get that right. Okay. A particular insulated pipe has the same rate of heat loss from the water as a pipe with no insulation. Find the thickness of this pipe in millimeters. Correct to three decimal places. So it's got the same rate of heat loss from the water pipe with no insulation. So a particular heat pipe would be H of X, like any heat pipe. And that's got to be equal to pipe with no insulation, which is H of 10. And X is the thickness. So F of X equals F of 10. Okay, well, it can't be 10. It's got to be something different. So it's 15.288. So is that millimeters or centimeters? It's got to be millimeters because that's in millimetres. Okay, if the radius of the pipe without insulation, the radius of the pipe with insulation, as shown in the uh, doubled, show the rate of heat loss from the water, H1, is now given by this. If the radius of the pipe without insulation and the radius of the pipe with insulation, as shown, are doubled, Uh, what's the original one? H of X. Negative. Was it negative 3200? 3200. On. X minus 5 squared. Log E. X minus 5 on 4. Okay. The radius of with insulation. The radius of with insulation is shown. A doubled. Show the rate of heat loss from the water. Um, X is the radius of the hot water pipe with its insulation. Hmm. To me, this looks like the rate of heat loss. Hmm. It looks like they've replaced X with X on two. So H one of X is H of X on two. If X is the radius, if you double it, it would make sense that you dilate at factor two, because if the radius was 10, if you doubled it, it would become 20, which is a dilation factor two, which is what that is, from the y-axis. Now, if you did that, you would get 3,200 
over x on 2 minus 5 squared log e x on 2 minus 5 on 4. I get 3200 on, if I take out the half, when you take it out, it's got to be squared. So you get a quarter. You get x minus 10. x on 2 minus 5 is equal to a half x minus 10, because if you multiply it back out, you get the same thing. But remember, it's in a squared, so we've got to square it. Log e. Now, if I put this, it's going to be x minus 10 over 8, because x on 2 on 4 is x on 8. I'd have minus 5 on 4. If I want to put it over a common denominator of 8, that would become 10. Dividing by a quarter is the same as multiplying by 4, which must give us the 12,800 over x minus 10 squared log e x minus 10 on 8. Domain of h1. Um, if it was 10 to 50 before, if we double it, it becomes 20 to 100. Because if you dilate, instead of starting at 10, it's now going to start at 20. Instead of finishing at 50, it's going to finish at 100. Um, we said before, this is dilated. Remember, h of x on 2 is dilated 2 from the y-axis. So dilated factor 2 from the y-axis. Find the area between the graph of h1 and the horizontal axis over its domain. Give your answer. Okay. So we can say um, from 20... to 100 of h of x on 2 dx. Um, have I defined this function? Yes. So let's try 20 to 100 f of x on 2 dx. to three decimal places, 1079.171. I don't even know what the units are in this bloody question. Okay, I can say unit squared because it's an area. But the area found in part A, B, A, E, I, okay. So they wanna know if we found the area of if that's a if i found from 10 to 50 of x it should be half of that which you can see it is so therefore it's a on two assuming i haven't stuffed anything up Okay, two down, fully cos everything so far. ax squared plus b, a is less than zero, so a is negative, b is any real number, c is greater than zero. Okay, because c is the, the um, x-intercept. Express a and b in terms of c and k. Okay, so let's get rid of all this crap. Um, a times x squared plus is it B? B. Define that as f of x. Now we know two things in this thing. Um, f of 0 is equal to k. And um, f of c is equal to zero because that's a y-intercept, uh, x-intercept, that's a y-intercept. Find a and b in terms of c and k. So we want to solve for a and b. 
So A is negative K on C squared, and B is K, which makes sense because it's the y-intercept. Okay, a particular tunnel is on its height of six meters at the center and a width of that. Find the rule for this arch. So if C is four, um, A, B, if K is, was it six? B is six. A is A on negative A on C squared, 16, which is negative a half. So Y is equal to negative a half X squared plus six. Except Oh, that's six, you dumbass. Six on sixteen, negative three on eight. Negative three on eight x squared plus six. A truck that has a height of three point seven and a width of two point seven will fit through the arch of the function hana. Goes directly through the middle of the arch, let D be the minimum distance between the arch and the top corner of the trunk. Find the value of D. Okay. So the width is 1.35 and the height is 3.7. So let's say T is 1.35, 3.7, and we know the curve is x negative 3 on 8x plus 6. d of x is the square root of x minus 1.35 squared plus negative 3 on 8x plus 6 minus 3.7 squared. Okay. So x minus 1.35 squared plus negative 3 on 8x plus 6 minus 2.7 squared. Or was it 3.7? 3.7 squared. Select all interactive calculation f min. Okay, the minimum distance is 1.68. Now it says to three decimal places, 1.680. What the frick? 1.680 meters. When x is equal to 1.940. So all I did there, sorry, I don't really explain it very well. Um, And that should have been squared. Um, any point on this curve is given by x negative 3 on 8, x squared plus 6. So to find the distance between that and that point, which is when they're going to be the closest, um, I just use the distance formula between that and then the point 1.35. 3.7. Now when we do it, that should be x squared. Okay. 2.18, oh, hang on. Yeah, that was the x value. 
2.185 and the minimum distance is 0.978. I thought it was strange that they made it. Okay. A different tunnel has a semicircular arch. This arch can be modeled by this function. State the value of R. It's just the radius, which is six. Two lights have been placed on the arch to light to light the entrance of the tunnel. The positions of the lights are that light. The areas lit by these lights are shaded in the diagram below. Determine the proportion of the cross section is lit by the lights. Give your answer as a percentage. Okay, so we know it's got to go through negative six. And that. So we can say um, to get this shaded area, we know this length here is 12 and the height is 5. So we can find that area, double it, and then take away that one, and that'll give us a total shaded area. So we can say shaded is a half, but we don't, don't need the half it, because so we're gonna have two of them. It's 12 times five minus a half of 12 times whatever that height is. So we can work out that height. Um, what do we know? What do we know? Um, okay, the gradient of this line, five minus zero over root 11 minus Minus six. That's kind of annoying, isn't it? Um, I mean, I guess we could use ratios. From there to there is six. From there to there is root 11. So we can find out what that height is. Let's call it H. H over six is equal to five over root 11. So H is equal to 30 on root 11. So times 30 on root 11. So all I did was use similar triangles. H over six is the same as five. Oh, hang on. Um, that distance there is not root 11. That distance is root 11 plus six. Nearly stuffed that one. H over six is equal to five over root 11 plus six. H is equal to 30 over root 11 plus six. 30 over 11 plus six. So 60 minus 180 over root 11 plus six. Um, What do I say? 60 minus 180 over root 11 plus 6. 40.679. Area of the semi circle is a half times pi times 36. 
which is 18 pi. Okay, the proportion that's lit by the light. So the shaded over 18 pi times 100. 40.679 over 18 pi times 100. That divided by 18 pi times 100. Seventy-one point nine three four, I think it was. Therefore, seventy-two percent to the nearest integer. That's the easiest way I could think of doing that. Um, because having to work out the equation of line and the y intercept and stuff like that, it's much easier just to create similar triangles. Question four. A particular petrol station has two air pumps A and B to inflate tyres. Each inflation of a tyre is independent. In, okay. Pump A is set to 320 and the pressure on the tyres will be inflated to follows that and the mean of that and the standard deviation of that. Find the probability of a tyre will be inflated to a pressure greater than 330 when inflated. Okay. So we know it's going to be about 16%. So a is normally distributed with a mean of 320 and a standard deviation of 10. The probability that A is greater than 330. All right, um, I wonder how we're going for time. I've been looking at it. Norm CDF 332 infinity. 10, 320, 0.1589, 0.1587, because we've got to round it up. Fellow of tires inflated by pump A to a pressure greater than A is 0.9, fell in the value. Okay, so the probability that A is greater than A is 0 0.9, therefore A. So we use inverse norm CDF, go to the right on this calculator, or if you've got the other one, you go to the left and make it 10%. Standard deviation was 10, mean was 320, 307.18. Therefore, 307 kilopascals. kilopascals. Okay. Um, pump is set and the pressure of the tiles being floated to his model by the following PDF. Um, determine the mean tire pressure. I feel like I've seen this function before. So 3 over 40,000. I'm sure I have actually. X minus 310 squared. Three thirty minus X. Define it. Yeah, what do we say? It was between three ten and three thirty. So what I always like to do with this is to test it and go from three ten to three thirty of F of X DX and it should equal one. If we want to find the mean, we know it's x times that. So we get 322. So the mean is 310 to 330. x times b of x dx, which is 322 kilopascals. A randomly selected tire is inflated by pump B. Find the probability of this tire being inflated to a pressure greater than the mean tire at the pressure of tires. Okay. So the probability B is greater than 322. Uh, it's just this. 
322.5248. This question has been on another exam. Because I remember that answer. Like the exact same question. Okay, the problem is, in time, is inflated by pump B to a pressure less than K is that. So the probability that B is less than K is equal to 0.95. Therefore, um, from 310 up until K of B of X dx, no, from k to 330 of b of x dx is equal to 0.95, therefore k is, so we say from, let's use k, equals 0 0.95, solve for Okay, now there might be multiple answers. Can't be 314, can it? Yeah, it can. So it can only be 314, it can't be that because it's outside the domain. To a pressure less than K. So I was right the first bloody time. 310 up until K. Let's flip this, 310, 328 or 331. So it's gonna be 328.047, but it says to the nearest kilopascal. Bloody probability questions go on forever. Okay, a motorist equally likely to use pump air to inflate one of their car tires. Probably the motorist has used pump A given that the tire is inflated to a pressure greater than that. So the probability um, A given that it's greater than 325 is the probability that's A and greater than 325 over the probability it's greater than 325. Okay, A and greater than 325 we haven't worked out okay so um norm cdf 325 to infinity 10 and 320, it's 0.3085, and we've got to times that by a half, um, because to go A, B, that's a half, and then the probability of A, So 0.1543 over 0.1543 plus, so B, B is this, 325 times a half. 0.1309. Okay, so we have that over that plus that. Um, so what are we actually doing here? Well, this is the probability of it being A and greater than 325. 
And this is the probability that it's greater than 325. It's A in th um, greater than 325 or B in greater than 325. So we get 0.5411 to four decimal places. Okay. The company that manufactures the pumps, tests all of its pumps and removes those that are defective. Probably around so pump from all pumps defective is 0.08. Find the probably four pumps that are defective from a sample of 25 selected pumps, correct to four decimal places. Okay. So we can say that pumps are binomially distributed. We've got 25 of them and a chance that one of them is defective. The probability that P is equal to four. So we go bind on PDF for 25.08.0899. P hat is a random variable that represents a proportion of pumps that are defective. Find the probability that P hat is greater than 15%. P hat is a random variable that represents the proportion of pumps that are defective. So the probability that P hat is greater than 15, greater than, if I find out what 15% of 25 is, 3.7. So that's the probability that P is greater than 3.75, which is the probability that P is greater than or equal to four. So we know we go from four to 25 out of 25 and 0 0.08, 0 0.1355. So the probability that P hat is greater than 15%, we always round up. For random samples of N pumps, P N is a random variable that represents the proportion of pumps that are defective. Find the least value of N, such that the probability that P hat on N is less than one on N is less than 0.15. So P hat is equal to X on N. So the probability that P hat is less than uh, on uh, P hat of N is less than one on N. If I multiply the N to the other side, I get the probability that N times P hat of N is less than one. And we know n times p hat is equal to x. We want the probability that x is less than 1. The probability that x is less than 1 is the probability that x equals 0, because less than 1 we know is just 0, is less than 0 0.015. So we want to know. Um, we want to know the probability that x equals zero so n choose zero point zero eight to the zero point nine two to the n has to be less than point one five so point nine two to the power of x has to be less than N has to be greater than 22.75. Therefore, N is 23. 
So you've got to have at least 23, um, 23 pumps. So that the least value of n, p hat of n, is less than 1 and is less than 15%. Okay, number five, one on five x squared minus six on five. One on five x squared minus six on five. F of x, negative four x on five. G of x. Mm, let's just quickly sketch them. Now we only want it from zero onwards. So that's our graph. Okay. Um, find the quantum point of intersection of the graph F and G labeled A and B in the diagram above. So we can say F of X equals g of x, given x is greater than 0, so we get a half and root 3 plus 1 on 2. A, B. Um, easiest one to put it into is g, because g is just a straight line negative two fifths negative two root three plus one one five determine the area bound by the graphs of f and g okay so our area is from our lower bound, which is a half, to root 3 plus 1 on 2. g of x minus f of x dx. So we go from a half to that. g of x, minus f of x, dx, simplify, and we want to get it over a common denominator, so combine, 6 root 3 minus 9 on 10, 6 root 3 minus 9, I wonder if you put it in a different order. <laughs> okay. P and Q, and we've still got to use F and G. One on AX squared. So is that comparable to the first one? If A was five, they would be the same. And if A was five, I would get negative four and five. They would be the same. So they would be, oh, I've just answered the first question. Find the value of A for which they're the same. All right, so this is the type, type of stuff that they do. A times X squared minus A plus one on A. Now, is this Q of X or P of X? Is this P, I think. P. And then Q. So, 1 minus A, 1A. One, 1 minus 
Hej. Um, hej. X. Define that as. Q of X. Okay. P of X equals F of X. Q of X equals G of X. So simultaneous equations. P of X. Q of X. Equals. F of X equals G of X. X A. A equals 5, which is what I said before. Find the positive X intercept of P in terms of A. So P equals 0. We want to solve for A, for X. Find the positive X intercept of P in terms of A. Now we want to solve for X. Okay, now it's got to be positive, so it's 1 on root a plus 1. The point m lies on the graph of that. The tangent to p at m is parallel to q. So we want to find when p dash of x equals... 1 minus a on a because it's got to have the same gradient. So d dx of p of x has to equal 1 minus a on a. So we get 2 to the third on a minus 1 to the third. Two to the third on one minus a to the third, a minus one times. And I get question people saying in the video, why did you put this instead of this? Okay, two to the third, a minus one to the third. It only asks for the x coordinate, not the y coordinate. Find the y-intercept of the tangent to P at M. So we've got to find the equation of the tangent. We wanted it that value, but we're just going to put one in there for the moment and then change this to that value. Okay. So we only want this. Copy that. Paste it. Put it all over a common denominator. Okay. 3 times 2 to the third, a minus 1 to the 2 thirds. Three to the two thirds, one minus a three times two to the one third. One minus a to the two thirds, was it? Um minus two minus two a over two a. Just say y equals. Okay, given that 2x on 3 is greater than 2 to the 1 third,
show that x is greater than 1, show the tangent parallel to p, q over y, negative y intercept for all a is greater than 1. Okay, if 2x on 3 is greater than or equal to 2 to the 1 third, x minus 1 to the 2 thirds, then 2a on 3, or we could say 2 to the 1 third, a minus 1 to the 2 thirds is less than or equal to 2a on 3. Therefore, we could say 3 on 2a times 2a on 3. Actually, it might be better if we separate this apart. So let's say 3 times 2 to the 1 third, a minus 1 to the 2 thirds on 2a minus 1 on a minus a minus 1. So we know this, that has to be less than that. So we've replaced that with that. that equals 1. Therefore, 3 on 2a, 3 times 2 to the 1 third, a minus 1 to the 2 thirds on 2a has to be less than 1. Therefore, less than 1 minus 1 on a minus 1 is less than, they will cancel it, they will be negative, so that's got to be less than 1 on a. Therefore, your y int is always negative if a is greater than 1. So here we say our y int If we were to put 1 here, this always has to be less than 1. If it's equal to 1, um, we know that they cancel and I get negative uh, 1 on A, which means the y intercept is always negative. Okay, the tangent parallel to P, the tangent to P parallel to Q has a negative y-intercept. The tangent at P parallel to Q. Explain why this implies P. Um, as Q passes through the origin, Um, and P will never, uh, um, will always have a, um, negative y-intercept um, q will never be a tangent to p. Therefore, q is always greater than p. 
therefore we'll always have a region bound by the graphs. Um, I don't know how they expect you to write that in such a short sentence. But if we go in and we sketch P and Q, remembering that they're both defined with A's in them. So given A is given A. Okay, so let's go from zero, zero, oh no, let's go from one. So one to a thousand. Okay, when it's one, there's no intersection. When it's two, you can see we've got a bounded area. As we keep increasing A, you can see there's always a bounded area. Let's make it go to. So there's always going to be a bounded area. Okay, part of the graphs P and Q are shown below where A is 100. The shaded area is bounded by the graph of P and Q. Find the smallest value of B such that shaded area is less than B for A is greater than 100. So, as they do questions like this all the time, as A increases, this shape gets more like that. So, if this stays constant, like if it keeps getting squarer, this area here is the maximum value that's going to be bounded by those two graphs. So watch what happens. As I increase A, you can see that that area in there, um, the area between the two graphs, that's going to approach a triangle And if that's a triangle, that length is one, that length is one, we know that B will be a half, because a half of one times one is a half. So the area bound by these two, P and Q, the smallest value B, the yeah, shaded area is less than B. So it's got to be, it's less than a half for A is greater than 100 can't equal a half, but that's the smallest value. Um, because if we went up to like, uh, let's, let's zoom in. If I went up to say 10,000, it's gonna become even more boxy. So you can see it's nearly a, like a, a square in there. So you know it's going to approach a half. So the area is always going to be less than a half. Okay, that's it. Um, don't know what to think of that exam. Don't really think much. Didn't particularly like it. Didn't particularly hate it. Thought it was okay. Um, I don't know. It just felt they're they're all getting a bit the same. If you've done plenty of past exam papers, you should be okay. Um, hopefully this was useful to some of you guys. Um, I don't know what they would want you to write here. Um, hmm. Can't say Q is always greater than P. Um, I don't know what to say. Q of X will be greater than P of X for some X where A is greater than one. So this graph is always going to be bigger than that graph. 
at some point, as long as a is greater than one, so there'll always be a region bounded by the graph. All right, um, good luck on your exams. Hopefully you do really well. Hopefully the videos have helped. Thanks.